Hello, you're listening to the Streaming Audio Podcast, and today's discussion is primarily about connecting Apache Kafka into other databases. I asked Francesco Tissiot to come on and tell us about using JDBC connectors, what they're supposed to do, how they're supposed to work, and where they can go wrong. Um, They can lose data because they don't have quite the right model for capturing database changes. So we talk about that. We talk about using Debezium as a better solution for capturing a stream of database changes. And then we also managed to cover a governance tool he's been working on and how hacking on Game of Thrones data got him his current day job. He's an interesting guy, so I hope you enjoy it. Before we get started, let me tell you that streaming audio is brought to you by developer.confluent.io, which is our education site for Kafka. It's got free information about how to build and maintain successful event systems. It's also got plenty of hands-on courses you can take and learn at your own pace. If you take one of those courses, you're going to need a Kafka instance. So for that, head to confluent.cloud. You can get a cluster up and running in minutes, and it will scale all the way up to production sizes. Just add the promo code PODCAST100 to your account, and you'll get $100 of extra free credit to use. And with that, let's figure out how to make Kafka play nicely with Postgres, MySQL, Mongo, and more. My guest today is Francesco Tissiot. Francesco, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I'm really happy to be here with you today. Good to have you. Um, so you're a developer advocate at Avon, or Ivan, Avon. Ivan. Ivan. Yeah. I'm, pronunciation is difficult, especially in this day of made up words on the web. <laughs> so what's that like? Give me a quick look into your background. Okay, so um, first of all, I'm lucky because the pronunciation of Ivan is the same in the Nordics and in Italy, making my life really easy. <laughs> so that, that's the thing. Um, what we do is we basically do open source data platforms as managed services on top of the major clouds. Uh, we do Apache Kafka, as uh, you may know. We do Postgres, Apache Flink, uh, MySQL, OpenSearch. So we try to take some of the open source products and create a cloud version of it. Well, it's not a cloud version. It's the same software running in the cloud as many services. What we do on top of it, if I can add, is we try to give back to the community. So we have an open source team which is dedicated to build with the community the open source products. So we have dedicated people working for Kafka, we have dedicated people working for OpenSearch. So we, of course, create our own managed solution, but we try to give back to the community of the communities that we take the the, uh, the software from. So it's win-win situation for both parties. Okay. Do you get involved in that? Where's your role in that um, Okay, so that's a good question and a tricky question at the same time. Um, <laughs> I'm a software engineer uh, by the 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 paper that I got at home, <laughs> I write some code, but I don't write a lot of code. So I believe with open source, a lot of people think that you can only contribute by code, but I don't hmm. think that that's true. I believe you can contribute in many different ways. One thing that I enjoy doing, I can do is, for example, write about a technology. This can take different shapes. For example, you can write about a feature in a documentation. Or what I do most of the time, you can write a blog post to enhance the knowledge of the feature being available. Or the other bit is, I see DevRel as basically trying to reduce the arrow from not knowing about the thing and understanding the coolness about the thing. So if you create, for example, a notebook that allows people to start with Python and Kafka, Well, you are doing a service to the community and also to the open source tool, in this case, is Kafka. So I believe I'm in in more of this stage of not being able, because I don't have the uh, knowledge of contributing directly to Kafka itself, but try to raise the audience, try to make it more accessible to people. Okay, that's interesting. A colleague of mine sees the job as being an enabler of technology. And uh, exactly. yeah, I can see I can see the parallels there. 
So, but before you got into that life, you did a lot of stuff with, uh, you must, must have had a large background in databases and you did a lot of BI stuff. Yep. Take us along that journey. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And that was a long journey. Uh, if you allow me the parallel, it's basically the same long journey that made me wait for a long time the day after the data from the day before. I was the person doing the BI system. I was responsible for a set of dashboards which were relying on one or more ETLs that were running overnight. Right. So I was always coming to the office or like connecting to the office in the morning and hoping that the ETL of the previous night was working successfully. And always having to wait like for two hours for like a day before being able to analyze the results. So mm. You're the babysitter is... of the overnight batch, right? Well, I wasn't responsible, but I my work was depending on that. I was doing the data analysis, but I was always late. So now yeah. when you see the streaming world coming up, well, that's where my brain started. But I believe my brain actually started smiling because understanding <laughs> that you could analyze the data in real time, you could create real-time uh, views or real-time SQL that could provide a business logic on top of the raw data and create like streaming things, this is when I started understanding, okay, I can make an immediate impact. I don't have to work on yesterday data. I don't need to accept a consistent delay in the data. Mm. I can do everything as soon as it happens. And this is where I started blogging about Kafka, I started blogging about two my, of my interests, which were Kafka and Game of Thrones, <laughs> and trying to match the uh, sentiment analysis in the tweets coming from Twitter via Kafka and doing with, <laughs> I believe at the beginning I did with R, doing the sentiment analysis. Right. Then I did also something using, I believe, an uh, automated uh, version from Google that was scoring in automatically the tweets, and I was building dashboards on top of, of, of it. So <laughs> like my old passion is to take a problem, which, you know, in the case of, um, of Game of Thrones, wasn't really a problem. It was a problem that I created myself. Still, it's a problem. <laughs> Those are some of the most and fun ones, right? Yeah. And trying to yeah. come up with a technological solution to solve the problem. And like, for me, literally, Game of Thrones and Kafka changed my life. Because now I'm a developer <laughs> advocate at Ivan, because Ivan found me after they read one of my blog posts. Ah, so you know, okay. it's it's a interesting word if you are willing to put a little bit of yourself out there. Yeah, that's true. Before we move on from that, you have to tell me what the results were. What the, what sentiment analysis did you get out of Game of Thrones? <laughs> okay, it was interesting and complex at the same time. Because I was doing, um, I was using a standard dictionary that didn't work well with the original theme of Game of Thrones. Because in if you write a sentence, uh, someone killed someone else, that of course has a standard scoring as negative sentence. But in Game of Thrones, because it was all about this kind of war again uh, between people, well, it's hard to judge. Uh, if that is a positive or negative sentence. But there were some, some interesting trends, and specifically, no, if you were not analyzing only one character at the time, but you were starting analyzing a couple of characters at the time. So I can't remember now the names, but if you could clearly see that a combination of characters had a very positive sentiment associated to them, because in a particular episode, they were basically, I, I, if I remember well, escaping from uh, a cruel guy and some other, oh, this cruel guy had an extremely negative sentiment. So you could see some patterns coming from <laughs> what the show was telling also in the data. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> I can't, it's going to be a while before that becomes a part of Hollywood script writing classes, but you could see it yeah. one day. <laughs> Yeah, possibly. Yeah. It's uh, it's something to think about the future. Like you see a lot of now in football teams, people doing real time analysis on all the biometrics of players. I believe, oh, right, yeah, 
Is that a word that we will see also in Hollywood movies? Maybe someone that will be able to forecast the impact on, on a certain sentence in a movie or reshape the sentence to have a better impact. I believe now with data, the luxury you have is that you can analyze and possibly forecast everything. You can also overanalyze and over forecast everything. So it's you have the benefit and the risk with everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe maybe I'll go with the perspective that more insight is better, and then hopefully we use it well, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I agree with that. Cool. So you're from that you get into working at Ivan. Avon, got to say that right. <laughs> I've, my my grandfather's Welsh and his name was Ivan, and now that's sticking into my head. <laughs> okay. Um, so you're living in this world where you're making lots of databases talk to each other, right? Yeah. So I believe uh, Kafka, as we all know, is most of the time just a middle layer. So what do you do with Kafka? You take the data from point A to point B. And if you take this kind of assumption into the real world, point A or point B most of the time is a database because like people have been using databases for the past 30 years, even more, mm. and they will oh. probably use database for the next 500 years or even more. So the fact that Kafka needs to talk with a database is something that we just need to accept. What I've been trying and checking is how you can integrate Kafka with a database. And specifically, taking my history of me coming from this or uh, kind of ETL mindset, I started digging about what is the default and the easiest way of interacting, of integrating Kafka with the database, which is using the JDBC connector. I mean, yeah. I've been using JDBC in order to extract data from or oh, to play with the data in another database in all my career in a way or the other. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you uh, you want to connect to a relational database with the Java based process. It's obviously your first go to tool, right? Yeah, and you know, it works. Um it works in some sense. It works if you think and if you approach the database from the Kafka point of view, still with a batch mindset. So if, for example, you have a source database and you want to take the data from the database into Kafka, but you want to do that once per day or every two hours, well, the JDBC does exactly what ETL tools have been doing uh, a long time. So you tell the JDBC connector which query more or less you want to execute against the database, and the JDBC connector will take the data into Kafka. Problem solved. The problems, and that's why I also gave this uh, talk at Kafka Summit, is when you start trying to use a solution which was originally aimed to solve a batch problem into the streaming world is where instead of trying to query the database, okay, tell me yesterday data. And I ask the question at like 1 or 2 a.m. because I want to be sure that the yesterday data is all landed in the database. Mm. This is the perfect batch problem. Now, when, with streaming, I'm asking the database, tell me what was happening five seconds ago. Tell me what's happening now. And it's where you don't have this time of being sure that the view that you have in the database is somehow static, that a little bit, little problems can start rising in the connector between the database and Kafka. Because um, there is a tendency with data for it to sort of stabilize after a few hours, right? Yeah, well, it, that's, that was always my experience. What we yeah. were told when we were extracting the data was, okay, you want yesterday data, but you cannot ask about yesterday data at one second after midnight, because mm. you, you will have always some latency somewhere. Mm. So you need to wait a couple of hours. You need to wait to wait for all the processes going around to finish, and then you can extract the data. That is, I believe, the standard way. But that doesn't work if you cannot wait the time, or if you are looking into five seconds ago, 10 seconds ago, if you are 
if you're shortening the time frame between when an event happens and when you want to know about it. This is the concept of streaming, basically. Mm. And this kind of batch-oriented solution, which is the JDBC approach, has problems. The best and, well, the worst part is that from a configuration point of view, everything works great. So once you spend your time, because I've been in, in that shoes, you need to spend a little bit of time trying to understand how to configure the JDBC source connector, how mm -hmm. to set all the parameters, how to set, you know, the query mode is a very important parameter that tells you how you are fetching which are the new rows compared to the previous poll. Right. When you set all these kind of things, at a certain point, you have the connector, which is up and running. And you start having a flow of events happening in the database and the same flow of events happening in Kafka. But then at a certain point, without changing anything, with your connector always running perfectly, you start seeing some differences between the two words. It's possible that even the, if the connector is working perfectly, you see some changes happening in the database which are not reflected in Kafka. And this is because, again, we are using a not optimal method to access the data. One clear example is possibly the polling time. So with the GADBC connector, we have to set a polling time which dictates how often we check for new data. Right, yeah. OK. So you have, let's say, 30 seconds of polling time. What happens if, in the database, you have an insert for a particular key? Let's say we insert a row for something happening in the city of Milan, and mm. then we delete the same row within the same polling interval. What we do is a query before and a query after. If the change is too fast, we will not be able to track it. So this is where trying to approach the problem of moving all the changes with a query mode start showing the limits. Is where you have events happening too fast, events that you cannot control. For example, there are some advanced mode in the JDBC connector that allows you to track the new rows based on a serial number or based right. on the timestamp. What happens if those serial numbers or timestamp get out of sync? What happens if a serial number that you thought it was always increasing suddenly is not always increasing because you have a new process that has an extra logic which uh, doesn't follow the old logic? So in those cases, even if everything is perfect from the connector point of view, and it's, per it's perfect also from the database point of view because there is no of, like official inconsistency from the database point of view, mm. still you start seeing two different realities between the database and Kafka. Because it's based on this snapshotting periodically idea, which doesn't quite fit with streaming, right? Exactly. Um, yeah. That's the thing. If we want to take the change of the database into Kafka, then we need to rethink uh, our approach. We cannot query based on a polling interval. We need to look into the database for something that possibly looks like Kafka. And if you think what Kafka is, Kafka are the basic bone, it's a log. Can we find the yeah. same log also on the database side? Well, yes, because... Um, if you write something to a database, what the database usually do is, you know, you write an insert to the database, the database receives the insert, writes the insert in the internal state, but then, just to be safe, let's write <laughs> another copy to a log, just in case, like, it, it, it usually works with my or my mother when we cook, because, like, I'm not a good chef, my mom probably is not either. Um, so we, when we receive an order, we write the order in the kitchen, but then we write also not somewhere just because what happens if the kitchen takes fire? Um, you always have the note and you can go back the, to the note to redo all the orders that you had in your, in your log. This mm. is the standard way that databases have been 
keeping the state, recreating the state in, uh, in a lot of different technology. In the yeah. talk, I used the case for Postgres. Postgres has a log file called the wall log where it writes down for each operation what was the operation. So in case the database state takes fire, in case you need to create a read-only replica, you have this information and you can rebuild the state from a certain point of time on. Yeah, so it's capturing so, everything that changes. There is something inside the database naturally capturing a change stream, right? For yes, replication exactly. and recovery. Yeah. Exactly. And, you know, that's kind of the interesting uh, information that we want to grab because that contains a specific line, a specific entry for each change. It's not going to miss a thing. It's not going to miss a change because it's the method for the database to keep everything in sync. Yeah. So it would be cool if we could take that information instead of trying to query often and often the database. And we have a solution for that because there are the Debezium connectors. Debezium is an open source project allowing you just to do that. It uses the best change data capture options that we have in the database to take the state from the database into Kafka, into a standard format of Kafka. And it works with a variety of different databases because it works with Postgres, with MySQL, with also non-relational databases like MongoDB. Okay. So it uses the, um, the mechanism that every database has a little bit different to track the changes and import them into Kafka. Okay, so because they all must have something like that inside, they're all they're all doing that kind of write ahead log in some format or another. So the essence of Debezium is to tap into that um, database specific format. Yeah, I believe uh, depending on the source database, some of them will have this kind of log that they will read. Some others, I believe, SQL Server has this concept of. Um, change data table. So when you apply the change data capture to a SQL Server table, it creates a new schema with a new table containing all the changes happening to the source table. Okay. In that case, you are still querying officially a database, but you are querying a change log table, which right. you will be sure will not miss an event. And is that an append only change table? Yeah, yes, I believe yeah. I believe so. Once you create this kind of change uh, change log tables, you expect these tables to uh, be append only, be some sort of the same as a log, immutable and append only. Then I, I believe you will yeah, go on. Yeah. It makes sense for, for them to model that as an append only table, right? Because logically they're very, very similar. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you do a change, so let's say you update a table or you insert a row, it's an event. You delete a row, you in the change log, you are not going to delete the insert event. You are just creating a new event there. It's the logic that we have been always all relying on Kafka. A, yeah. Every event is immutable. If there is a change in the state of the source transaction or whatever, it's a new event for us. Yeah. It's funny. There's like when you first come to things like Kafka, you think this idea of having a log of events is a very new and very weird thing. But actually, a lot of databases are already doing this under the hood and have been doing so for years, right? Yeah, exactly. I believe. So, what I see the beauty of Kafka is that for the database, this was an extra necessary bit that you were doing to keep consistency. For Kafka, it's the main bit that they are doing. We do this. We just write one event at a time. And of course, then you have compacted topics and all these other, other bits of pieces that you are creating on top. But the reality, the basic reality is Kafka is a log. We yeah. want to have a way of replaying all the history of logs if needed. With Kafka, there is there have been a lot of talks about is Kafka the perfect solution for uh, long term storage? Maybe yes, maybe no. It gives you the opportunity. 
because mm. it can act as middle layer. You can take the data from the database to Kafka to Amazon S3 if needed. But there is nothing officially stopping you from keeping the data for a long, long time in Kafka as well. Yeah. Yeah. And having it as that permanent record of everything that happened to your data, your audit log. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And the, the other beauty that I find with Kafka is that I've been working with databases that were requiring you to use a specific tool to write the data in and to write or to read the data out. With Kafka, you are somehow agnostic of who is the producer and who is the consumer. You can write with one code into Kafka. You can read with another code, with another tool from Kafka. Mm. They don't need to talk with each other. They don't need to speak the same language. The only language that they need to agree on is the data format of the events. Yeah, and you've really get you've decoupled writing and reading quite nicely. Yeah. Yeah. Th- <laughs> I believe coming from a closed down solutions into the uh, open source world, this is also something that I feel really eye opening because now you can select which is the best tool to solve a problem. Also, one thing that I've been talking a lot with kind of in this kind of middle land between databases, Kafka and other technologies is that for example, you have you may have all your data in a certain database. But then one of your team needs to do text search. And let's say that your database doesn't offer any functionality for text search. Mm. So what you can do in that case is you can start up your mission of kind of freeing the data. You put Kafka in the middle. You create a source in the database, pass into Kafka. Let's put the data in open search to uh, allow like some te- uh, advanced text search. Or on the other side, you could say, "Well, no, I will upskill the team doing uh, um, with the team with the need of doing search into my SQL language." So you're creating yeah. a barrier in there. What I've seen in corporate in corporates in a long time is that the more you create barrier, the more you are basically forcing people to go around those barriers. So the other team will probably, at a certain point, do a select star from all the tables that they want, create a CSV (laughs) export, and use their own tool to do whatever they want. So allowing to have Kafka in the middle and you managing Kafka allows you to take the control on what you are doing, take the control of providing a consistent view of the reality to a lot of different teams. Mm. So it's not that you are forcing them to export a CSV and like who knows what's happening to the CSV? Who knows who manages the CSV? We never saw any kind of company uh, sharing customer data on an unprotected S3 bucket. That never happened, right? Mm. (laughs) If you basically force people to find alternative solutions, you open the door to a lot of possible problems. If you are managing on the other side a consistent flow of data, well, you are providing value to the team that is using their favorite tools in order to solve the problem, while at the same time ensuring that all the bits and pieces are secured and protected as you want. Yeah, yeah. I've definitely worked in um, banks where the database team really, really didn't want to share connections to the central database for security reasons for the fact that they might accidentally write something they shouldn't they might not actually they might see something they shouldn't but you're right making them jump through hurdles to get around that is also a terrible mistake and the solution is to find a good way to safely rebroadcast that data in a read only format and that's why Kafka's exactly yeah you know? yeah so i've been in a similar space i was designing centralized bi tools and if you like you couldn't evolve too fast because you have the complexity of managing the all, all these kind of things like the access of a certain person to a certain data set and if you were not evolving as fast as possible as fast as the requirements people were doing exactly the same thing they were exporting entire data set into excel and then going wild with excel which was exactly the same <laughs> problem so being yeah. able to evolve, being able to provide the data 
always it's both provide accurate data and real time data so you don't also have the the problem of having stale data that you're working with so you are creating this kind of data flows you can manage the data flows with like streaming tools like ksql or apache flink you can change the shape so if you have different stakeholders that need to see only different portion of the data only different fields of the data you can easily reshape and create different streams and fetch give this information to all the relevant people in streaming mode and you are you have more or less one good reliable central touch point that is apache kafka that allows you to shape all your different data patterns yeah this sort of starts touching back on the idea of um, a data mesh where you're publishing your data as a first class product with governance yeah. of which fields are accessible right yeah i believe so one interesting thing to me is the more i'm in this kind of data world the more i care about the metadata because I believe that is the interesting part, which is sometimes overlooked, but is really, I believe, something key that we should always look after. Because together, when you publish a data set, the metadata describe to the outward how that data set should be used, how the fields make sense, how they should, how the a consumer should take those fields. Is a field optional? Is a field should be a field considered numeric or not? Mm. Is that a field an address or a phone number or whatever? The metadata is extremely valuable information. And we see with data mesh with all the explosion of data that we had in the recent years, that having accurate tracking of data is a key thing. And I spent some time, I also built an open source tool that allows you to, for example, track all your data lineage across different tools and map oh, that okay. as a set of nodes and edges so you can see data lineage, you can answer all the kind of queries related to data as data assets. Like who can right. see my code? Who can see my data? Uh, which fields are accessible to which people? What if I change a column here? What is the impact? All these kind of complex queries if you start tracking all the journey of the data, become just a network query, more or less, a graph query. Oh, interesting. What, what, what's that tool called? That sounds interesting. It's called Metadata Parser. There is an open um, GitHub repository uh, under the Ivan, uh, which is Ivan slash Metadata Parser. Go and check it okay. out. It covers Kafka. So I'm analyzing the uh, Kafka topics, uh, if you have ACLs on top of the Kafka topics, and but that's only Kafka. Then when you expand that to other systems, for example, you have a connector taking the data from a database into Kafka, and what the tool does, it browses the uh, configuration of the connector, finds out which are the sources, mm -hmm. which are the targets, and creates dots and edges between all of them. So you now have an automated way of creating a network of all your data assets. Interesting. And that's presumably a really good tool for things like GDPR, but also for change impact analysis. Right? Yeah. Nice. Um, it's it, The basic thing is you have a lot of metadata. You need to make sense out of it. And as you said, GDPR reasons, who can see my, my data? Um, data lineage, impact assessment. I also had people from the security team saying, uh, what if I create a new ACL? What is the impact of a new ACL? Mm. You know, you create a fake node, you run a bunch of scripts, and you have the reply. On the, if you didn't do that, you had to go back to, OK, let's do an audit. Let's plan <laughs> yeah. the audit for next week. Let's try. Let's create a clone environment of what we have and try to understand the assessment with metadata. Well, it's all all there. That's nice. I'm gonna have to check that out. We'll put a link to that in the show notes, definitely. Yep, happy to do that. So before we wrap up, I I do want to get back to uh, Debezium because I just want to pick your brains on two a couple more points. Right. Um, the first is it occurs to me it must be faster and more efficient. Right. 
because you're picking yes. up changes as they happen and, and you're only picking up what's changed. Yes, exactly. So uh, with the Bezium, whatever your backend technology is, you are only picking what's happening. So this means that you are not going to miss any change and you possibly are not having problems with a change being replayed or something like that that can happen with custom queries. Yeah. Then regarding it's fast, um, yes, it's faster. Um, I believe there is a little note here about depending on which technology you are pointing back. Because, for example, for Postgres, the um, basically the replication system of Postgres will ping Kafka with all the new changes. So it's almost immediate. Right. For other technologies where you are querying the, like the change log view that is created on top of a table, that is still kind of a per query basis. So I believe you are able to set the polling interval in there. But still, even if uh, you have this kind of minor delay, it's not like you are querying the source table over and over again with a custom query that you built. You are querying yeah, yeah. a change log table. So possibly the impact of that uh, type of query is much, much minimal. You can run it much, much uh, more frequently. Right. So it may be push, it may be pull, but you're definitely just getting everything that's new. Yes, exactly. Okay. Everything that is new, one thing, uh, if you are trying the JDBC connector and you have hard deletes, check what's happened with hard deletes in your Kafka topic. That might be a surprise that I want to give to uh, the people listening to this podcast. <laughs> yeah. So if that's one reason to go and check out Debezium, look at the way it treats hard, de hard deletes on the JDBC connector. Yes, exactly. Have you got any tips for getting started with Debezium? Um, for getting started. So first of all, I would say the Debezium documentation is exceptional. There is a tons of things to learn for whatever source database you are using. Again, it, those connectors are different depending on the source database. So mm -hmm. if you are coming from DB2 or if you're coming to Postgres, this set of instructions will vary. I would start, depending on which is your source technology, with the Debezium uh, documentation. That's the first place. The second mm -hmm. thing. Um, I've wrote a blog post about using the Bezium with uh, Postgres in my case. Again, that gives you a little hint on what are the fields that you are going to use. What are the discussions that you are going to have with your DBA if you want to take that out of Postgres? Oh, yeah. Because that's, that's the other thing. When you are taking that out of the database, you will probably have to deal with the DBAs, which are the owners of the database itself. Mm. The cool thing about the Bezium is that you are talking their language. You're using their tools in order to export the data to Kafka. You are not creating a special case, a special type of query for Kafka. You're using exactly the same tools that they have been using to replicate the state to other instances of the same database type. Mm. So I would start there with the Bezium documentation. The, um, the Bezium also have, has... Uh, some sample code that you can use in order to start creating your Kafka connector. Then check out the um, the blog post. Then I believe also Kafka Summit recording might be available sometime soon. Those and will be I would up suggest soon if they're not already, depending on timing yeah. of podcast releases. Yeah. And I would suggest, well, check out the full session. Uh, it contains the code that I used to recreate the example for both JDBC and the Bezium. And it's also a nice way to get into how the Bezium works. Okay, cool. Well, you've given us two, two tools to check out, and they both sound very interesting. Uh, we'll link to both of them in the show notes and to your YouTube talk when it comes up. And, and in the meantime, thank you very much for joining us, Francesca. It's been Thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure speaking to you. Cheers. Bye for now. And there we leave it. Now, for me, that's useful information I can file away from my day job, and I hope it is for you as well. But right now, I've got a hankering to find a stream of tweets about TV shows and look for patterns. That'd be a fun side project. That probably means that Francesco is very good at his job as a DA, because I feel informed and inspired. So thank you, Francesco. 
If you are similarly informed and inspired by today's episode, now is an excellent time to click like or thumbs up or leave a comment or a review on your podcast app or whatever. We always appreciate hearing from you, so please drop us a line. And if you want to get in touch about anything on the show, my Twitter handle's in the show notes, along with links to everything we've talked about. For more information on Kafka itself, head to developer.confluence.io, where you'll find guides on how to use Kafka and how to make it integrate well with other systems like Postgres, Mongo, and others. And when you need to get Kafka up and running, we'll take a look at confluent.cloud, which is our fully managed Apache Kafka service. You can get started in minutes, and if you add the promo code PODCAST100 to your account, you'll get $100 of extra free credit to use. And with that, it just remains for me to thank Francesco Tissiot for joining us, and you for listening. I've been your host, Chris Jenkins, and I will catch you next time.